Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Mind Check Policies to Support Youth Mental Health, uh, where we will be discussing the mental health of our nation's youth post pandemic and how federal policymakers can better support the mental health and well being of our young people. I'm Julia Harris, Associate Director of the Health Policy of Health Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center, a think tank in Washington, D.C. Um, as you all probably know, America's youth are suffering unprecedented strains on their mental health. A CDC survey of adolescent behaviors and experiences found that about 20% of high school students considered suicide during the past 12 months, and more than 40% of teenagers said that they struggled with persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. Youth suicide attempts, self-injuries, and drug overdoses have all been increasing, and absolutely shocking has been that nearly one third of high school girls and half of LGBTQ plus students said that they had seriously considered attempting suicide. While these alarming trends cannot be blamed on any single factor, the acute lack of mental health and substance use treatment options for youth, as well as pressures from the pandemic have definitely played an outsized role. Uh, despite this escalating need for services, our youth face a behavioral health care system that is grossly understaffed and often does not work well for them. Nearly half of our nation's young people uh, do not get the services that they need. And 70% of counties in this country lack a child psychiatrist, 81% lack a child and adolescent psychologist. The result is often emergency departments with drastic increases in pediatric visits. Uh, and EDs really should be a last resort. They don't have the capacity to handle this surge, and they're not designed to provide the ongoing treatment that our youth so desperately need. The good news is that members on, of Congress on both sides of the aisle, as well as the Biden administration, have committed to addressing the youth mental health crisis. Later this year, the Bipartisan Policy Center will launch a youth mental health and substance use task force to develop a national strategy that improves mental health and addiction among youth. We thank today the Commonwealth Fund for supporting this event and BPC's behavioral health work at large. Today, we'll be hearing from uh, two members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who are working on these critical issues. I'd like to introduce uh, Congressman Seth Moulton. He's a U.S. rep serving Massachusetts Sixth District. As a member of the House Armed Services Committee, Congressman Moulton is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Strategic Forces. Additionally, Congressman Moulton sits on the new Select Committee on Strategic Competition between the U.S. and China and the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. We'll also be hearing today from Congressman Gus Bilirakis. He's a U.S. rep serving Florida's 12th District. As a senior member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Congressman Bill Rockis chairs the Innovation Data and Commerce Subcommittee while also sitting on the Health Subcommittee and the Communication and Technology Subcommittee. He's also been recognized as the most effective Republican lawmaker in Florida by Vanderbilt's Center for Effective Lawmaking. I will now turn it over to our esteemed congressman to make their remarks. Hi everybody, Congressman Seth Moulton here. When I decided back in 2019 to become the first sitting member of Congress to talk about my own mental health struggles, when I disclosed dealing with post-traumatic stress after serving four tours in Iraq as a Marine infantry officer, first of all, I didn't know if it might end my political career right then and there. But instead, I received amazing outreach from people all across the country who wanted to do more about our mental health crisis and work on mental health. And so I released a three-point plan to try to improve mental health care in America. One plank of that plan is establishing a three-digit nationwide mental health number. And that's what Chris Stewart and I of Utah accomplished with 988. It's a bipartisan bill passed by two veterans who understand mental health issues because of our service to the country. And it's had a tremendous impact in the first year that it's been implemented. Calls are up over 50%. And texts, which is a good proxy for youth access to the line, texts are up 1,135%. That's a sad measure of the need, but it's also a great measurement of how many young Americans are getting help. The second plank I talked about is improving mental health care and mental health care access for veterans and active duty service members, not only because they deserve this care, 
and they've certainly earned it, but because they set a great example for everybody else. If a Special Forces soldier or a United States Marine can access mental health care, can benefit from strengthening his or her mental health, then you can too. The third plank, which, which is the most ambitious, and we're just starting to work on it now, is really aimed at normalizing mental health care. My vision is to make an annual mental health checkup as routine as an annual physical. No one questions why you have an annual physical. No one says, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you if you announce that you're going to get your uh, regular checkup? And it should be the same with mental health, but sadly, we know that that's not the case today. So what we'd like to do is ensure that every child in school gets a mental health checkup every year. Now, the details of this plan, exactly when to do it, when to start it, uh, how it should be impl implemented, uh, those are very much up for debate. And we've been receiving tremendous input from experts in the field about how to make this happen. But there's no question it will take a lot of resources, money from Washington and the states, a commitment to increase the number of mental health professionals nationwide, and a commitment from so many adults to make sure that this can actually be implemented at schools all across America. It's an ambitious plan, but it's one we believe in and one we're pushing in, and something that we would really be honored to have your help with in the years ahead. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for taking part in this discussion. And it's an honor to share a few thoughts with you today. Thank you for inviting me here to discuss an issue that is very important in my opinion. The protection of children, there's no issue of greater importance. Our country is experiencing an unprecedented mental health crisis, particularly among our children and teens. Now it is normal, it's a normal part of development for te teens to experience a wide range of emotions. It is typical, for instance, for teens to feel anxious about school or friendships or to experience a period of brief periods of emotional fluctuation as they adapt to hormonal changes and new circumstances. Again, that's normal, we experience that. However, the disturbing trend, the trends we are seeing are way outside the normal bounds and they are a cause for alarm and action. We've seen a disturbing spike in rates of depression, self-harm, suicide attempts, a death amongst teens with teen depression, in particular, rising by more than 60%. Emergency department admissions for self-harm and suicide among girls between 10 and 14. It's unacceptable. This is no small part due to the isolation cause by social media. New research shows that 46% of all US teens say they use the internet almost constantly. And 97% say they use the internet daily. A 2019 study shows that teens who use their electronic devices and mobile phones for over five hours per day were 66% more likely to have at least one suicide-related outcome compared to teens who spend an hour or less a day on social media. Sadly, the COVID pandemic made things even worse. Because of teens' impulsive natures, experts suggest that teens who post content constant constantly on social media are at risk of sharing intimate photos or highly personal stories. And you know, again, I've had round tables uh, with teens on these particular issues. So I heard it directly from them and will continue to do so. This can also result in teens being bullied, harassed, or even blackmailed. Teens often create posts without considering these consequences or privacy concerns. Teens are also exposed to dangerous or harmful content while online. Nearly 90% of teens encounter sexual content online, according to 2021 report by Children's Internet Safety Monitor BARC, with a majority reporting exposure to pornography by age 
13. So very sad. A growing number of teens also report being solicited to purchase illicit drugs while using social media platforms. Really, I mean, this is unacceptable. We must do something about this. We've heard stories about some of these drugs being laced with fentanyl, leading to overdose and death. And also xylazine uh, is another drug uh, that's being used frequently by teens, and it is deadly, particularly if it's mixed with, uh, with the fentanyl. My hometown newspaper, the Tampa Bay Times, published an article about Tampa Bay area teens being depressed and anxious with social media primarily to blame. It told the story of the Tampa area resident, her name Catherine, who's constant comparing herself to others online. It led to a decline in her mental health and ultimately an emergency room visit from a suicide attempt. Tragically, a middle school student in my district committed suicide just last year. The investigation into her death showed that she had been the victim of vicious cyberbullying on social media platforms. This happens so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Her parents had no idea this was going on. These statistics and stories are deeply troubling and I have grown increasingly frustrated that social media companies are not doing enough to help. A group of energy and commerce Republicans and I penned letters to big tech CEOs requesting information on inter internal research conducted by their com companies on the effect of social media products on children's mental health. Yet the companies refuse to comply with this request for basic information. As information began to trickle out from whistleblowers, we are able to figure out why the CEOs remain silent. First, the Wall Street Journal published a piece with leaked studies conducted by Facebook on the negative effect Instagram has on teen girls. This leaked information made it apparent that the American people have been misled by the disturbing impacts social media is truly having on our children. I'm incredibly concerned about these revelations. Big tech is keeping us online longer than ever and lying to do so, all with the purpose to polarize and monetize us. They must stop their practices that are driving depression, isolation, and suicide. This is a public health crisis and the deception from social media is unacceptable. As a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I was a strong supporter of provisions in the mental health package we passed last year to ensure that HHS is conducting research on smartphone and social media use by teens, including the effects of use on behavioral and physical development. I expect the research to confirm that we've already seen what we've already seen happening in our communities. And I believe more must be done in this space. Make no mistake, Congress will act to protect our children. During our committee hearings, on this topic, including our recent hearing this year, where we, bought, well, where we brought the CEO of TikTok in, there was broad bipartisan agreement that we need to do more to hold big tech accountable for the harmful impact its platforms have on children's mental health. We must hold big tech accountable to protect children on their platforms and seek transparency so parents can make more informed decisions with regard to their children. I thank you very much. This is a very important subject and very close to my heart, and I will continue to do everything I possibly can on our children's behalf. Thank you.
Thank you, Congressman, both for your perspectives on these issues and the causes. Uh, it's certainly important for us to discuss all of these things and talk through smart evidence-based solutions, which is where uh, we are going next. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, our amazing partner in this work, my colleague, Reginald Williams, Vice President of International Health Policy and Practice Innovations at the Commonwealth Fund. In this role, he is responsible for fostering international dialogue, exchange, and education that enables U.S. policymakers and healthcare leaders to learn from cross-national experiences. Reggie, over to you. Uh, thank you, Julie. And uh, thank you all for joining us in this important discussion today. Um, as you know, the need is great. Uh, the youth in America need better access to care, supports, and services to ultimately meet their needs and thrive. This is one of the reasons why the Commonwealth Fund has gotten engaged in the mental health and behavioral health and substance use spaces. It's because there's a great opportunity right now to make impact uh, and ultimately help people live the lives that they wanna live. And through our work at the Commonwealth Fund, we try to support this activity in four major ways. First, that's expanding equitable access to behavioral health services. Then supporting the integration of primary care with behavior. Three, strengthening and diversifying our workforce through using a wide variety of resources. There are many people that can ultimately help support individuals' needs, and there's an opportunity to use technology in a positive and then finally, leveraging the strengths of our Medicare and Medicaid programs. We have robust opportunities to leverage the strength of those programs to ultimately meet the needs of people better. And doing that for youth is vitally important. And that's why I'm excited that we have four panelists today to talk through uh, various aspects of ways we can continue to improve and address the crisis that we've been hearing so much about on TV, but also witnessing ourselves personally in our lives. We have four individuals here today. Salome, who is the founder and host of Going Digital Behavioral Health Tech Summit, the largest conference focused on virtual behavioral health, is here to speak with us about her work and experience. Two, Rasheen, Chief Medical Officer of Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, will be offering a medical and clinical perspective based upon her work as a board certified adult and child and adolescent psychiatrist, as well as having academic research experience at the University of Texas, Austin. John McPhee, CEO of the Judd Foundation is with us today. And the Judd Foundation is a nonprofit that seeks to protect the emotional health and prevent suicide amongst the nation's teens and is working really actively with young adults and giving them the skills, supports, and empowering them to thrive in today's environment. And finally, we have Raina who's joining us who is a youth, mutual, a youth mental health advocate and founder of UMatic. In her work, she has been able to really take her lived experience and bring forth packages to teens in crisis that are enrolled in a wide variety of programs in local communities. I'm excited to have this wonderful panel of experts and people with lived experience here today to really delve into what we can do to make youth mental health, a uh, uh, better situation uh, in our nation. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my first question is, is for Rashini. Um, given that you're, you're working in the, the space of, of clinical practice and you see uh, people on a wide variety of, of, of different kind of care needs, could you speak a little bit about what you have observed in your practice work and, and, and what you think uh, you know, the, this experience that we see going on is, is, is all about? 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the question, for the opportunity to be here with you all today. Um, you know, as a practicing psychiatrist, it, during the midst of the pandemic, I led a pediatric healthcare team and the building of a pediatric mental health service line at a local children's hospital. In that, you know, I oftentimes saw children and adolescents in our emergency rooms, in our inpatient units, and in our outpatient clinics in crisis. You know, and Julia was talking a little bit about how the ED is really our last resort. You know, and unfortunately, because of the lack of community resources and the lack of early prevention, early intervention and detection, the emergency room was sometimes a place where we'd see children and adolescents for the very first time seeking out mental health care. That's obviously not ideal, but it's really a reflection of some inefficient workflows and really some growth opportunities where we can think about how to better integrate behavioral and mental health into primary care and into ways in which we can start to see children and adolescents earlier. The other aspect that I would offer is that, you know, through an innovative program um, called CPAN, which is a telephone consultation line for pediatric primary care physicians, I continue to have the opportunity to see children or adolescents for a one-time telehealth visit um, from a, as a referral from a pediatrician and then write a brief recommendation letter and talk with the pediatrician about what, that, what the diagnosis and treatment recommendations are. Um, through that, just earlier this week, I had the opportunity to see an adolescent who was struggling with mood and anxiety concerns. We were able to really talk about what were some of the different psychosocial stressors, what are the things in her environment, and what are the things from her medical and physical health that were contributing to her overall mental health. And then we were able to thoughtfully think about a treatment plan that incorporated all aspects of care, thinking about medication, therapy, school interventions, and then relay the information back to the pediatrician so that they could continue to take care of this patient. Well, thank you. You know, you, you touched upon this, this issue of uh, telemedicine and the use of technology to uh, positively help uh, youth reach services. Salome, I'd like to bring you into the conversation and, and hear a little bit about um, what you have been learning and seeing around healthcare professionals' use of technology and ultimately how it can meet the mental health and substance use needs of children and youth. Yes, thank you, Reggie. I mean, just to echo everyone, the dire demand and shortage is causing a huge problem in youth mental health. And there's such a huge opportunity for technology to expand our shortage our workforce and get youth the care they need. But in particular, I'm really excited about the opportunity for tech because that is how youth want to consume their health care. And, you know, for me, I started as an anxious teen. And back when I was 16 years old, I was reading books at Barnes and Noble and learning as much as I could about OCD and panic attacks. But ultimately, when I was 16, I decided to create a website and create information for other teens just like me, because that is how I wanted to interact with peers and the healthcare system. Now there's so many more innovations. And, um, and you know, as the Congressman had mentioned, social media as well, we can't, uh, we can't forget to include that in the conversation. The world has evolved so much in that time. And, but that also means more opportunity to use tools to support young people to get the help they need. And I, and I think you really raise uh, 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 an important uh, kind of issue there. Uh, people are looking, uh, youth in particular, are looking for ways to access services wherever they are. And it's my understanding, um, John, from some of the work that you do, that you've been looking kind of beyond the, the clinical setting, but looking in at uh, schools, uh, educational facilities, the community, and looking at some of the different ways that, that youth are uh, accessing services outside of traditional care settings. Could you talk a little bit about that for us? Yes, I'd be happy to. And, and thanks so much, um, uh, Reggie, um, uh, for the question. Um, 
So yeah, I, I work with the Jed Foundation and we work with schools to help schools implement what we call a comprehensive approach to mental health and suicide prevention. And that's really about creating a culture of, of care around students so that we can uh, make sure they're developing the skills to navigate mental health challenges um, and to prevent um, issues from growing into bigger issues. And also to make sure that we have systems in place to recognize or notice a young person who's struggling and get them connected to care. Um, I'll make a couple of comments first just about why schools are such an important place to do work. Um, you know, they're the, they're the in, right, in real life systems where most young people are. And in fact, about 70% of youth who are seeking and receive mental health care are getting it through their schools. Um, and, and so schools have the people, the culture, the policies, the programs that can be threaded together into a mental health, uh, a mental health safety, safety net. Um, as part of this conversation too, though, it's important that we recognize that there are data uh, that show that uh, most uh, ha emergency room visits and hospitalizations uh, for young people uh, related to mental health uh, happen actually during the school year. So we need to recognize that um, there's some work we have to do also to make schools and, uh, a safer place uh, for, for some youth who, um, who uh, experience greater uh, challenges in the school setting. So when it comes to getting mental health care through schools, to your question, we have a significant and longstanding issue related to uh, access to care problems uh, for, for young people. It's now exa exasperated by the number of staff and school counselors that are burnt out uh, and turning over. And, and so much of this gap uh, today is being filled, and I, I describe this as a positive, through telebehavioral health providers, right? The telebehavioral health providers really emerged and provided uh, a tremendous um, help and way to access care during, during COVID. Uh, and this is, this is now uh, growing. And Solomay referenced uh, and referenced this. Young people are able to access care more quickly through text, through video, through these, uh, through these platforms. And school systems and states are contracting with telebehavioral health and digital behavioral health providers um, to augment the services that they're providing to students. I think in this space, though, it's important that we also look at standards. How are we defining success? How are we uh, measuring whether these interventions are effective or are they effective in, in certain ways and perhaps less effective in other ways? Um, this really sort of needs to be studied and standardized carefully. This is something Dr. Tom Insel has talked about. So I'd say it's exciting, but it, 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 um, it's something we have to look at, at carefully and, and really watch and make sure the care being delivered is is uh, as best as it possibly can be. And also that different school systems in different states are learning from the experiences that they're each having so that we can um, all learn together as much as possible. The last thing I'll note here that's important from a policy point of view is that in terms of providing mental health care in schools, we need to do a better job finding mechanisms that are durable in terms of how this is being paid for. There are great inequities across schools and across communities as it relates to access to care. Um, so how can Medicaid be leveraged? How can we ensure that insurance is paying for school-based um, uh, mental health care? How can we ensure that when government grants and government funding um, are being deployed, that they just won't end, you know, and leave schools in, in a shortage. So there's, there's place, uh, place there, um, I think, also for policymakers um, to be attentive to. It, it, it's, it sounds as if there's, there's lots of promise here to expand access, and we, we have definitely made some, some great strides. But this, uh, as some have called it, a uh, public health emergency that we're living through right now um, ultimately still impacts individuals' ability to, to access care. And Rihanna, I, I wanted to kind of bring you into the conversation because as we understand it, um, you once spent three days in an emergency room waiting for care. Um, and, and so could you talk a little bit about your experience and, 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 and why you didn't get access to what you needed to immediately? Yeah, um, so when I was 15, I was struggling pretty severely with my mental health. 
when I told my therapist that I had been feeling suicidal and had taken an overdose of my medication a few days prior, she told me I needed to go to the emergency room. Even though I wasn't really at imminent risk, there was no other youth crisis services or other options available in my community. So the emergency room was the only place I could go. I didn't think a lot of it at the time because every other time I had been to the emergency room for a medical emergency, it was for my nut allergy. Um, where I was able to get the care that I needed when, and when I got better, I was able to go home pretty quickly. Um, but like Roshni touched on earlier, the emergency room should not have been the first place I was getting medical mental health care for the first time. Um, because unfortunately the emergency rooms only treat really the physical aspects of suicide, not the psychological ones. So all the emergency room could do was put me under suicide watch, which means keeping me in a glass room with no curtain, put me in a hospital gown and take away my phone and basically kind of treat me like a pet in a cage um, while waiting to send me somewhere else. I understand that having someone physically watch me for 24 hours a day while I slept, ate and went to the bathroom might have been necessary if I was actively trying to harm myself. But given the mental state I was in, I was just a kid wanting help and not having anywhere else to get it. And it felt relatively dehumanizing. And I think one of the most confusing things to me at the time was the complete absence of any sort of treatment that I received. Unlike when I had been in the emergency room for my allergies, I never saw a psychiatrist in the ER. And while, of course, they continued to give me med my medications, there was absolutely no attempt to provide any other kind of treatment to help me manage the thoughts that were making me feel suicidal or even the stress of being a kid on suicide watch in the emergency room. Um, the first night after they had taken my vitals, the emergency room doctor told me that a social worker would be in the next morning to talk with my mom about finding me a psych bed. But to my surprise, when the social worker came on Saturday morning, she said that none of the local adolescent psych beds had been available. And there were several other kids in the emergency room also waiting for an inpatient psych bed. So she would have to check around 11 the next day. And so it went from Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And finally, I was lucky on Monday to uh, get a bed that opened up. But I was lucky because I had private insurance. I wasn't a young child and I didn't have any co-occurring conditions and I wasn't violent. So it was like a lot easier for me to get a bed than some other kids that would have to wait much longer than I did. So I went to the emergency room expecting treatment, but instead it felt more like idle and isolated displacement. As someone who already felt a deficiency of self-worth and was drowning in overwhelming negative feelings, being warehoused in an emergency room and watched constantly without any semblance of treatment or support was definitely like the last thing that I needed at the time. It was such a contrast to when I had been in the emergency room and my problems um, we're treated with an urgency, skill, and compassion. Why does the emergency room have everything it needs to treat a nut allergy and not a mental health problem? The CDC estimates that between 150 to 200 people die every year from a fatal food allergy, but by contrast, 48,000 people die by suicide. Maybe if our health system were as good as, at treating suicidality as it is as treating nut allergies, suicide wouldn't be the second leading cause of death for young people in this country. I'm glad you're you're here with us today, and uh, I, I would love for you to take a, a couple of more seconds and reflect on uh, what would be ideal care uh, from your standpoint. Um, what would you uh, rather happen when you had those needs? Um, of course, it's important to think about how to fix the system that uh, treats mental health conditions, but I also think it's of equal importance to consider the factors that are leading to this unprecedented rise in adolescent depression and anxiety. So the underlying factors like social media, loneliness, social inequity, and unrelenting like pressure to be perfect all the time are making my peers worse than ever when we have more resources, knowledge, and opportunity than ever. And also, how can we co-create a system of care that works better for young people? Um, are you asking kids what would work best for them? I know that sitting in the emergency room in a residential unit playing cards and staring at walls was definitely not what helped me. I definitely got better when I had a chance to learn skills for my coping, to connect with my peers, and to do something productive to help connect with others. I think that if we infuse the voices of young people's lived experiences and policymaking, we would do more to create opportunities for social connectivity and activism that 
young people really want. And I think this is very necessary to do. Now, Rashidi, uh, bringing you into the conversation here, I know that you've been focused on different types of models of care that ultimately have the ability to address some of these issues that have been raised. Could you just speak a little bit about things like the collaborative care model or other approaches to really addressing this, this crisis? Yes, absolutely. Um, first, I just want to say I wholeheartedly agree. And Raina, thank you for your courage and sharing your story and just helping us to really look at the importance um, of, the, of the voice, of the lived experience and thinking about social connectivity. Um, so through our work in the Meadows Institute, we really look at implementation of clinical programs and how those implementation of programs guide our policy recommendations. One of the programs that we've really looked at and championed has been the collaborative care model, in which you look at having a behavioral health care manager that is embedded within a primary care physician's office that helps to look at routine screening and measurement informed care. So how do we know that if you've been diagnosed with depression, how do we know that treatment is effective and working? Um, and then that behavioral health care manager has the opportunity to you have a psychiatric consultant whom they meet with on average once a week, and they can really talk through the different kind of nuances of diagnostic criteria, come up with treatment plans together, and then that pediatric primary care physician or primary care physician, because this is an adult model and a pediatric model, um, kind of helps to be that overall treating physician with help from the behavioral health care manager and the psychiatric consultant. Now, the beauty of this model is that it really empowers primary care physicians to feel more comfortable managing mild to moderate mental health concerns within the primary medical home. And that is key because as we've heard earlier, we don't have enough child psychiatrists or pediatric psychologists or really any pediatric mental health clinicians. And so programs that can really work as a workforce extender to allow a child psychiatrist to be able to treat, um, indirectly treat and consult on more patients and to help the primary care physician feel more empowered to be able to treat effectively, those are the models that are going to be most sustainable as we really think about what we need for, to address our youth mental health crisis. John, can, can you talk a little bit more about um, how schools can, can really uh, empower youth to meet their needs? Yes. Um, so, you know, I talked earlier about how schools are a great opportunity to um, to create a system of mental health safety net, if you will, uh, around young people. And so a couple of things really need to happen here. One is that schools, when I say schools, I mean schools, school systems, districts, um, states, right? Our education system at every level, uh, there should be a plan for how student mental health is being supported and promoted and risks for substance use and suicide or are being reduced. And that plan should follow uh, recommended best practice for how to do this. And what it involves is both a preventative approach and a system where you can notice and treat uh, or get to treatment those students that are struggling. So this involves things such as um, the development of life skills, right? Um, such as, uh, coping skills, uh, ability to recognize your own emotions and understand when you might need um, some additional help, problem solving skills. Um, and then from there, the idea that schools can help uh, promote a sense of connectedness and belonging uh, for young people, between young people in the school and the support of adults in their, in their lives um, and help reduce uh, isolation for those who are isolated. We also want to develop, um, we want to reduce stigma and develop this idea that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to, um, to sort of speak up and to seek help and to, and to check in and ask if your friends or students are okay. So a lot of work uh, that schools should be doing in this preventative space. And then um, it's important to make sure that they have the policies and the protocols in place to help notice if a student is struggling. And then the pathways to get them to care. Some care might be provided in the school, 
They might be referred out to the community. Uh, they might use a telebehavioral health provider. But this all need this system needs to be uh, mapped and connected, um, and it's going to look different in different schools depending on the resources that are available. And also, a really big part of this is the protocols and the approach around partnering with families and caregivers and parents. When are the parents brought in? Um, how, how can the school and, and the families work collaboratively around this to make sure youth are getting the care, uh, the care that we need? So this is what the JED Foundation does with schools. But the idea is that there should be a plan. There should be a team overseeing that plan. And then that, that plan should be implemented in a sustainable and durable way. For policymakers, what I would say is that this should be supported by policy, by resources, by the identification of, of best practices, um, so that we're really making sure that we're helping schools help uh, the students that they serve uh, with these kinds of uh, public health um, and uh, sort of holistic systems uh, to help take care of their well-being and mental health. Now, each of you, again, has kind of touched on this whole issue of uh, technology being able to help uh, support uh, youth mental health needs. And uh, Salome, I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, what do we know so far about how digital mental health solutions are meeting youth needs? And I, I'd love to hear a little bit about how these, uh, these technologies and approaches can meet the needs of historically marginalized communities, uh, youth that are living in rural areas. C could you expand on the promise of tech here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I would also like to echo my colleagues and Raina, just thank you for sharing your personal experience. That's really giving us a, a real life look on what the system is today. And we just have so much more to go and change. Um, <clears throat> and Roshni, you had said uh, one of my favorite words, workforce extenders. And again, going back to the power of technology to make a difference in this space, I'd like to share an example of um, something in my work these last few years. When I'm not planning a conference, uh, I had the opportunity to run a philanthropic fund on behalf of Pivotal Ventures, which is Melinda Frenchgate's personal office. And our focus was adolescent mental health, specifically LGBTQ teens and adolescents of color. And we found that uh, when we made funds available for therapy, the uptick was not quite what we would have hoped, but when we pivoted to a text-based solution, somehow the utilization from LGBTQ teens in particular skyrocketed. And going back to what Raina said as well, is we actually have to have young people around the table if we're going to create solutions for them. In speaking with them, we found that they preferred a text-based solution because they were stuck at home and they wanted to talk about private uh, things in their lives. For example, maybe they weren't out yet to their families and they didn't want their families to hear because they were right in the next room. So they preferred a text-based solution. So this goes back to the idea that for when it comes to youth mental health, we need to create solutions that are designed specifically for them. We can't expect to retrofit existing adult solutions and expect that the engagement is going to be where we want it to be for youth mental health. So lots of opportunities there. And um, I'm just excited about the work that my colleagues are doing here. Uh, it's exciting, going back to your original question, Reggie, uh, how, how are we seeing that are these things even working? You know, on one hand, we've got a lot of growing evidence that a lot of these innovative digital mental health tools are making an impact for young people, uh, clinical outcomes, financial as well, creating more affordable access to mental health for young people. We're seeing that uh, technology can provide the front door to many of them getting triaged into higher levels of care if they so need it. But at the same time, this space is very nascent. And so while we do have plenty of short-term studies showing some promise in this space, we also need more time, more resources, more support from policymakers and beyond to invest in reimbursement models and more longitudinal research to um, continue the research base in this space.
Great. Um, I, I want to kind of turn turn our attention to, to policy right now. And I, I think each of you have, have mentioned not having access to providers, needing to support providers, needing to think more broadly about providers. Um, we, we know we have a behavioral health workforce issue. And so I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, what steps could Congress or, or states independently uh, take to build a workforce that is ultimately better meeting youth needs? And, and Raina, I'd love for you to uh, reflect upon your experience about what would a good workforce look like? Um, I think similarly to the third plank of Congressman Moulton's mental health plan, we need to treat mental health emergencies with the same urgency, skill, and compassion that we treat physical health emergencies. There is no reason we should be losing 48,000 people a year to suicide. And I think an annual mental health check-in would be a great way to start this initiative. I think just by investing more and by treating it the same way, destigmatizing it politically and socially would be a great way to start. Obviously, that's a big step to take, but I think that's a very necessary one as well. I think that if we treated it, if we treated mental health crises like we did breaking your leg or something like that, we could not only have more resources, but also get more um, input from the youth that are actually in crisis to see actually what they would need and what they think would be best for their own treatment. John, same question to you. What can Congress or states do to address workforce issues? I think one thing that's really important to look at is to look through the eyes of the young person that may be considering entering a career as a mental health provider or clinician. And for us to look at what is the, you know, sort of the ratio of, of, of benefit to potential challenge around how much that education costs and what they're potentially going to be paid, you know, on the other side as a provider. I think that there's room here for um, in need here for reimbursement rates um, and for compensation for mental health social workers and psychologists and, and other clinicians to be strengthened and potentially student loans to, uh, and, and costs on, on, on the side of what it takes to become a clinician to be, um, to be changed in a way that creates more incentive for people to, to enter this field. Also, as I mentioned earlier, the telebehavioral health um, industry, I think it provides uh, a great deal of promise, um, though we need to recognize that what's happening is we have a shortage of uh, uh, mental health workers in bricks and mortar settings. And the telebehavioral health companies have helped us um, provide more access to care because of that. But they're also now hiring and growing and actually exacerbating that problem, which makes the problem even more urgent. But from a policymaker point of view, how are we measuring whether telebehavioral health is effective? And in what ways is it most effective? How can we get that data quickly? How can we standardize those learnings so that we can ensure that this very promising emerging field um, is bringing as much benefit as possible and bringing it early and in an equitable way uh, across communities in the country. And, and John, kind of just following up on that, um, how do you ensure that connection between maybe school-based services, virtual services, and then services that may you know, be in the community uh, through clinics or, or more traditional uh, healthcare settings? How do you make that connection? So it, it requires careful planning and mapping of the resources, and it's essential, right? Schools should be connected to their and leveraging all of the resources that are available in their communities. So we need to make sure that our schools and our school districts have the resources and have the human capacity to do this planning. Um, so when we talk about resources, human resources for mental health care uh, related to young people, we need to make sure that it's not just uh, the providers we're talking about, but it's also capacity around the planning so that we can do the th what you just said, which is really map out and make sure that careful choices are being made um, and informed choices about um, connections in the community, also connections to family and, and working in those relationships with families, and then with the telebehavioral health providers. Alabama, as I understand it, actually um, has a position in its school districts that focuses on mental health planning. I believe that's that's new. 
um, I would recommend that as something, for example, uh, for policymakers to to look at as something that can be deployed and resourced and would help tremendously in this kind of integration and community of care that we're talking about. Salome, same question. Well, I'd like to touch on something John mentioned, this idea that we're uh, potentially competing for virtual providers and, and the brick and mortar you know, for me, when it comes to digital and virtual care, uh, on a scale of innovation, we have everything from um, totally self-serve, novel AI, uh, prov the provider isn't even involved at all when it comes to digital mental health tools, to the very other end of the spectrum. There's not that much innovation over there. It's just taking one-to-one -one therapy and putting it online. For me, my, my enthusiasm around, is around that middle area of truly workforce extenders where the provider is still in the driver's seat, but the digital technology is expanding their reach to that many more patients. But the thing is about that is this area of this broad category of digital mental health is, is uh, again, nascent and it needs further definition. And so my recommendations, uh, similar to recommendations we provided in a recent report with the Commonwealth Fund and Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, is first off, uh, getting the support of CMS to potentially put together an informational bulletin to clarify what are some existing avenues for support and adoption of digital mental health technologies and working with the FDA, ONC, SAMHSA and others to define more precise categories of this broad thing we called digital mental health technologies, which is quite a bit more broad than just digital therapeutics, which we do have some pathways for. And then finally, uh, ONC potentially helping us to develop more data security, interoperability and privacy standards when it comes to digital mental health technologies. Thank you. And Rasheen, you, uh, what can policymakers at the federal and state level do to support workforce? No, I think one of the essential aspects is really thinking about a fully integrated system. Um, like Raina so beautifully described, um, the, the way that we look at physical medical care and the way that we look at mental health care is oftentimes very different and disjointed. So if we can create a system that any place that a child receives any type of care, physical or mental health, that all of the providers are connected. So for instance, if a child receives care in the school setting, um, and we know that you know children spend more than 50% of their time in school. So school is a very natural place for them to receive services. But if they receive services there, then those services are connected with the community, with the pediatrician, um, and we really start to think about from a policy standpoint, the pro models that work like collaborative care that are evidence-based, fiscally sustainable, that those models can really be reimbursed at the rates that would make it continue to be fiscally sustainable. In particular, as we start thinking about children and adolescents, recognizing that children are not just many adults. We need to be able to adapt models to be able to meet the needs of our youth. Um, Texas, in the state of Texas, we actually had a great example with Senate Bill 11 um, that passed in the 2018-2019 legislative session that funded um, four different programs, two of which, CPAN, our telephone consultation line for pediatric primary care physicians, and TCHAT, our Texas um, child health access through telemedicine. The nice thing about this is these programs have an ability to be interconnected. So you really start to think about integration so that care does not feel as disjointed and it feels easy to access. The other aspect that I would mention is as we think about behavioral health integration into primary care um, and school-based work, we need to start also thinking about prevention. What kinds of policies and recommendations can be helpful in really being able to screen and prevent mental illness? So what are the different tools that we can use to be able to, to teach children and adolescents resiliency? 
How can we promote things that we know are effective, like mindfulness, things that even come before mental health treatment, so that when an individual does present with concerns of a significant mental illness, that we're catching it early. Because if we catch it early, we know that treatment is going to be so much more effective. So it's really mirroring what we do on the medical side in regards to prevention, quick access to care, and sustainable treatment. Oh, thank you. And, and Rana, you get the final word uh, today. Uh, if there um, were one thing you could change about youth mental health, what would it be? I think that there are a lot of things, but I think the most important thing is just we should just empower more young people to be engaged and drive their own care. Let us tell you what we need rather than you tell like you just giving us what you think we want and what you think we, we need and what the, you think works best for us. Just better integrate youth voices into our own treatment. Well, thank you. Uh, nobody could say it uh, better than that. I think the next steps are clear. Uh, our behavioral health needs and particularly amongst the youth are at public health emergency and crisis levels. Uh, now is the time that we have an opportunity to really expand access to equitable behavioral health care services. Yes, the issue is complex, but with bipartisan engagement, the federal and state level, there's an opportunity to, real, to make real change here. And so I hope uh, everyone today heard a little bit about uh, opportunities to make change. Thank you all for engaging in this uh, discussion. Uh, it's an important discussion, and we know that we have more work to do. So thank you.